yeah, I think the only thing I would say is um, it, it's a forever evolving industry. Um, you know, and, and, and I think as, as, as we have done collectively over these workshops over the years, um, look at a printed circuit board circa 1980 and look at what's on your iPhone today or whatever, and, and you see what the challenges are, right? And as, as the industry changes and as 5G is on the horizon and who knows what these components, like what, what these structures are really going to look like um, on our side and, and even your side, Mike, right? We have to continue to evolve our technologies to meet the challenges you know, that are coming down the road almost almost every day now. That was Sal Sparacino, one of several panelists on this special roundtable edition of Reliability Matters. Welcome to Reliability Matters, a podcast for the electronic assembly industry. Each episode covers topics related to reliability, best practices, and environmentally responsible assembly techniques with insights from experts across the electronic assembly industry. Now, here's your host, Mike Conrad. Welcome to Reliability Matters. Today, we're going to do something a little bit different. Today, we're hosting a roundtable discussion on the subject of cleaning circuit assemblies after reflow. After all, contamination removal is exclusively performed to increase the reliability of circuit assemblies and the products they are installed in. With the rapid expansion of electronics due partly to automotive and Internet of Things, IoT, cleaning of circuit assemblies has increased dramatically, and with that, challenges to cleaning have also increased. Because cleaning is commonly an end-of-the-line procedure, it falls victim to assembly procedures earlier in the assembly process. As a result, cleaning technology, equipment, chemical, and processes must be reactive to overcome the challenges presented by the assembly process. Today, we're going to discuss some of those challenges to cleaning, and to do so, I've recruited a panel of experts. Today's cleaning roundtable features a number of experts from Zestron, a company known for manufacturing innovative chemical solutions for the electronic and semiconductor markets. With me today are Ravi Parasarathi, Applications Engineer, Umit Tosin, Engineering Manager, Dr. Terry Price, R&D Chemist, and Sal Sparacino, Sales Manager. Welcome, everyone, to Reliability Matters Cleaning Roundtable. Glad you guys are here. There are a number, of, as I mentioned earlier, there are a number of challenges to cleaning. And what I'd like to do is throw a few of those challenges onto the table and get comments from our expert panel on you know, best practices to resolve those challenges or to overcome those challenges. So one of the challenges I hear a lot about is jet printing. Traditionally, solder paste is applied to... A, a bare board with a stencil and a squeegee. We've been doing that ever since the beginning of surface mount technology in the late 70s, early 80s. Recently, there's been a move to um, print the uh, solder paste through a jet, basically um, like a a, a hydraulic system or some type of, of, of pneumatic system that would force the solder paste out of a very small nozzle and deposit it exactly on the board where it needs to be deposited. Uh, There's a lot of advantages to that because you could put as much or as little paste exactly where you need it. And some of the um, downsides of stencil printing are eliminated with jet printing. On the other hand, when technology introduces an advantage, it usually also comes with uh, equal disadvantage. And one of the disadvantages is the uh, residues from a jet printing process are more difficult to clean. So I'd love to understand the reasons why it's more difficult to clean. And then let's discuss how we overcome that higher level of cleaning difficulty. So I'll, t- I'll turn it over to whoever wants to uh, tackle that. Just say who you are. And since I can't see you and, uh, and we'll get started. So let's talk about jet printing, why it's more difficult to clean and how we overcome that l- level of difficulty. Hey Mike, uh, this is uh, Ravi Partha Sarathi, and uh, and uh, I will uh, answer your question about jet printing. And uh, it is indeed uh, we are starting to see uh, more and more customers actually who are starting to look into the jet printing. And uh, one of the reasons, as you mentioned earlier, is uh, the advantages it offers is uh, it uh, eliminates the possibility of uh, using stencils as well as stencil printers. So it uh, significantly reduces the expenses that's uh, involved with buying stencils 
on a regular basis and uh, maintaining and uh, uh, keeping up with the stencil printers. But uh, the drawbacks of uh, jet printing is uh, due to the different viscosity and density of the paste and such, the jet printing paste uh, currently that's available in the industry is all like uh, type 5 and type 6. Whereas when it comes to screen printing paste, it's all type 3 and type 4. So if we go to the solder paste uh, classifications where we look at type 3, 4, 5 and 6, each one as we go higher in types, the paste, uh, the, the, become, the powder becomes more, more finer and, uh, so, and the metal content also gets reduced. So jet printing as we get to type 5 and type 6, the metal content is reduced the powder size is finer, so to compensate for that, you need to add more flux vehicle to the solder paste formulation. So now that you are adding the say, uh, increased amount of fluxes to minimize the oxidation that occurs, now by adding more flux, you have it also increases the cleaning challenges because now you've got to clean those increased amount of fluxes. So the advantage jet printing it offers is more in terms of like uh, you can see the uh, in uh, the new trend that we are seeing is the increased both density complexity where we have like a uh, uh, very low profile components such as QFNs, uh, POPs and uh, uh, LGAs, uh, the large size components which are uh, densely populated, it's uh, stacked against uh, smaller components sizes like the 0402s, 0603s. So a lot of customers are starting to use jet printing as a, a complementary step to stencil printing. So they will first stencil print the board so that they get a uniform uh, thickness. And after that, they can go to a certain comp a certain area of the board which needs more solder paste volume and they can jet print it. So before jet printing came into the market, a lot of customers were using step stencils. But again, they had to, they had to go with step up, step down stencils, and so they can now minimize this completely by using the jet printing paste. Uh, the challenge it offers, definitely, as you mentioned earlier, is in terms of the cleaning. Um, we have seen, and actually, there has been numerous uh, customers and case studies which we have uh, presented a couple of years back at the Apex conference, as well as we have seen across a lot of customers, is they are slowly transitioning from a type 3, type 4 paste to a type 5 and type 6. And uh, the process parameters which worked for them for cleaning the type 3 and 4 flux residues is no longer the same process parameters is not applicable for type 5 and type 6. So we are starting to see that uh, when it when customers are starting to clean type 5 and type 6, especially the jet printing paste, uh, they definitely near have seen a uh, tendency to uh, optimize the settings in terms of increased wash temperature and perhaps even increasing the wash time. So that's where the jet printing brings up the challenges where uh, the paste which was previously easily cleanable with uh, lower process settings, the same settings might not work moving forward when it comes to jet printing paste. So it's pushing the cleaning process closer to the edge of the envelope, right? Exactly. And uh, so this not only uh, demands a requirement from the cleaning uh, suppliers, like we uh, have to... Uh, increase the temperatures, the concentrations, and uh, the process times, but it also pushes the envelope for the cleaning equipments because not all cleaning equipments can go to very high temperatures as well. So if uh, there is a temperature limitation when it comes to uh, how high can you go, so in that case, you might have to compensate that by perhaps uh, increasing the wash cycle time. So it's a uh, Jet printing is definitely pushing the envelope for the cleaning agent, the cleaning chemical suppliers, as well as the equipments, and also is putting more focus on the design engineers to see how they can improve the board design so that they can uh, get better cleaning results underneath such components. So since time and temperature are one of the, um, uh, the requirements to overcome the challenges of this type of, of uh, solder, um, deposition uh, methods. Any any time you increase temperature or time, you're really putting a more taxing role on the equipment and the chemical. So 
uh, typically the for quote unquote normal cleaning processes, historical cleaning processes, one would run at a temperature of about 140, 150 degrees Fahrenheit for six or seven minutes using a defluxing chemical at 10 to 15 percent, for example, with the extra effort required to effectively clean residues from jet printing, what temperatures are you typically seeing are, are being required and what time? And does that require the use of a different chemical or does the same chemical just have to be monitored more carefully when used in that more aggressive environment? Uh, what, what do you see there? Uh, well, that's actually a, a very good question, Mike, because uh, jet printing, we did this extensive study with all the available jet printing paste that's available in the market. It was done about a couple of years back. Uh, uh, to everyone's surprise, like, uh, it's just like there are only six to seven different jet printing paste that's available worldwide. So when we did this study, uh, when it comes to jet printing, uh, there are only two, there are two ways of looking at it. Uh, like uh, scenario one is where you have a customer who is using a particular cleaning chemical and now they are uh, looking at jet printing paste and they say that we want to use, we want to stick with this uh, cleaning chemical, cleaning agent A. And we are open to looking at uh, different jet printing paste, whichever jet printing paste is easier to be cleaned with this particular chemical. The scenario B would be another customer who is now open to looking at a complete new cleaning chemical, and but he wants to continue using this. Uh, uh, he doesn't want to change the jet printing paste. So there are two different scenarios when uh, it comes to jet printing. So when we did this study, we found that not all jet printing paste perform the same. We looked at about six to seven different cleaning chemicals, and we looked at six to seven different uh, jet printing paste. And there was this uh, uh, findings that we saw that depending on each jet printing paste might perform different to different chemicals. So there are some cleaning chemicals, cleaning agents, which performs really well with a certain type of jet printing paste, whereas others which are not. So what I was coming to say was there are some jet printing paste which might be easily cleanable at around 140 to 150 degrees Fahrenheit if you have the right chemical being used or if uh, a certain chemical has already been qualified and they cannot change the chemistry because it will involve a huge qualification and jet printing paste it's easier to change because it just comes in cartridge. So they, in that case, they might have to possibly like there has been few cases where customers have to go as has 160 to 180 degrees Fahrenheit and uh, five to seven minutes. It works well when it comes to like cleaning on the surface. But we are starting to see that when it comes like for uh, military defense, basically for class three assemblies where they have to clean under QFNs and LGAs and those type of low profile components and they want to remove the residues from underneath those components, they really need to increase the wash time. And in batch cleaners, we have seen at times they have to go to even 15 to 20 minutes of wash time depending on the board complexity. And the same holds even true for the inline cleaner, where typically the inline cleaners would run at say one foot to 1.5 feet per minute. It might be required in certain cases to go down to as low as uh, 0.5 feet per minute, just to enable enough time for the chemistry to get underneath and remove those uh, flux residues. So when uh, whenever a chemical say in a batch process or even an inline process, but particularly batch, which uses a smaller volume of solution uh, to clean during a wash cycle. Uh, when a chemical is exposed to that long a process time, that requires a pretty robust chemical formulation. So Absolutely. it has the loading capacity for the extra volume of flux that's that comes with jet printing and that it can physically uh, handle the the stresses of high temperature and you know being squeezed through 20 30 40 nozzles uh, for a long period of time that that I would guess I'm not a chemical expert but I would guess that would put some strains on the chemical formulation as well uh, you are absolutely right and this is where the pH neutral comes into picture because uh, the older formulations and such was more about 
uh, in terms of they did they did not have the inhibition package corrosion inhibitors enough corrosion inhibitors or the right package so you could start seeing some metal discoloration over a period of time due to longer exposure and ph neutral is able to remove this uh, fluxes more effectively and at the same time due to its uh, neutrality it's no longer affecting the components so uh, under such harsh conditions a uh, suitable cleaning agent which has right inhibition package or a ph neutral formulation will definitely help in uh, giving better cleaning results as well as ensure full compatibility that's excellent. We're going to talk about in a few minutes, we're going to get into the pH of chemicals and, and how the process works. You did mention uh, just a few moments ago, low component standoff heights, and that's actually one of the challenges to cleaning. So we see uh, with QFNs and other bottom terminated components, I'm not sure what was in an engineer's mind when they designed bottom terminated components. Maybe their mother never said, I love you enough, but there was something angry uh, about that whole process. Let's take components and let's stick them down on the surface of the board and let's not give any clearance for cleaning and, um, and stand by and watch everyone go crazy, which is kind of what's happened. So in our world, you know, we, we build the cleaning equipment side of it. You know, we, we compensate with, more pressure, finer water particles, things like that, to try and get under uh, the lowest of the standoffs. And now with components coming out with effectively zero standoff heights, uh, which have the ability to entrap um, certain types of fluxes and, and their activators and not allow the cleaning process to either easily uh, impinge underneath that small gap or not allow it at all, that certainly produces a lot of challenges. And from a, from a chemical and or equipment standpoint or a process standpoint, what, are, what is our industry doing to effectively remove the residues that are trapped under these very, very small spaces? Uh, in regards to that, like it's in our industry, that's where like we have to start educating uh, the customers on uh, it's not always easy to clean underneath components and that are, after a certain time there is a limitation that a cleaning chemistry or cleaning chemical can only do certain things a cleaning equipment also has a certain limitations and that's where like uh, at, uh, over here at zestron like we have been collaborating with a lot of oems and uh, we are working with them and uh, getting the design engineers actually getting more educated because they need to understand that uh, not always you can like, they cannot be uh, putting low profile components right next to each other, the board complexity and because they need to understand the limitations when it comes to cleaning. Of course, the design engineers don't consider cleaning because for them it's only designing the boards and they look at that part, but it's the manufacturing engineers and uh, uh, people like us and yourself who are Actually, then when the boards doesn't come off clean, they reach out to us, to you guys and say that, okay, we are, we are not getting good clean boards. How do we improve it? And uh, as I mentioned earlier with the design engineers, as when it comes to low profile components, such as uh, QFNs and such, uh, one of the things that we have found and we are starting to uh, talk to more and more customers is uh, in terms of the solder mask itself, like there are so. Uh, for low profile components in certain cases like BGAs or even LGAs, uh, QFNs, uh, it might be better to remove the solder mask or have no solder mask underneath those components. So that is one scenario where if you are able to remove that solder mask, you are able to increase the standoff height and which enables now the cleaning agent to get underneath the components and uh, remove the residues more effectively. So this is one thing which uh, actually when uh, I was in contact with one of the customers in Asia, they have actually specified for their components. Like if customers are using their particular components, then they suggest is to go with no solder mask strategy rather than uh, have solder mask on the boards. So if, if there's changes to the solder mask to allow more clearance, is that change done after the boards are delivered? Are people you know, sandblasting off solder mask or are they, are they talking to the board suppliers, uh, the they fabricators? They talk to the board suppliers itself and get that uh, solder mask. And uh, during the Gerber data and when they are uh, designing the boards, the bare boards, they make sure that for those particular locations where for such low profile components, they might just remove the solder mask. Yeah, very good. And, you know, one point to make, this is not a direct 
um, solution to uh, low standoff components. But one of the reasons we have low standoff components <clears throat> and small components in general uh, is so that we can put many of them in a small footprint. Exactly. And, and we have this yep. extreme high density. And what's driving you know, cleaning was mainstream before 1989 and the mid 90s. It pretty much, with almost without exception, everybody cleaned. And then, almost overnight or within a few year period after the Montreal Protocol and the ban on the solvents that were used to clean, uh, a lot of the industry stopped cleaning altogether. The, your class three people, spa, whatever space people were back then, obviously kept cleaning, medical kept cleaning. But for the most part, all the consumer stuff, class two, class one stuff, just stopped cleaning altogether. And then, and the reason we stopped cleaning is everyone switched to rosin or to uh, no clean flux and no clean flux has a very low residue content relative to what was common at the time and boards had a tolerance for that residue and as as technology has marched forward and as densities have increased because component sizes have gotten so small the amount of residue tolerance an assembly can can get away with is much smaller than it was before. So it's it's not that um, suddenly we discovered boards are dirty. They've always been a certain level of dirty, but the boards were able to withstand it. These low standoff components kind of create both the need for cleaning and the challenges for cleaning all at the same time. It's a it's, it's a it's a uh, kind of a perfect storm of of opportunity because now more cleaning companies sell their, their products, more chemical companies sell their products um, because of low standoff components. But these same, these same little business generators are wreaking havoc in the cleaning industry because they are increasingly more difficult to clean. So it's, a, it's, it's be careful what you ask for strategy there. Um, yeah, and just to add to that, Mike, also uh, the requirements, the lifetime requirements has also gone up like now with the radar, with the small form factors and all such, they require this uh, assemblies where the board goes into, they need to last for 15, 20, 30 years, or even in excess of 40, 50 years. So that puts in an additional strain on uh, all these assemblies. So that also increases the need for cleaning this uh, residues. Sure. And automotive is one of the leaders of that. As we, uh, I, I've said this in, prior podcasts, I have two cars. I have a 1968 Mustang and I have a 2018 uh, General Motors product. And if the electronics fail, if 100% of the, of the electronics fail on my Mustang, I can't listen to my AM radio. Everything else is electrical. Nothing else is electronic. On my other car, my new car, um, if any one of the electronics fail, I could have a host of serious issues. Not only will my infotainment system not work, but I, my my steering might not work because it's all electronic steering. The braking is electronic. The uh, uh, the um, accelerator is electronic. My car will steer itself, and and if that system fails, who knows where it's going to steer me into? So uh, that the, the critical nature of electronics is certainly heightened more than ever before, and. In the case now of electric cars, from the moment that car runs off the assembly line, those boards are on and they don't turn off until the car is crushed in a crusher, you know, 10 or 20 years from now. Um, unlike traditional fossil fuel cars where the computers are off, they boot up every time you start the car. On electric cars, they're always on and, and monitoring the charging and, and monitoring the, for the for the key fob and whatever else they do. So, uh where in the automotive industry, the uh, the projected life of a car was 10 years or 150,000 miles without a significant number of, of uh, failures. Uh, now, if that same thing is applied, if that same standard is applied to electric cars, we now have 10 years or 150,000 miles of computers being turned on and not off. And some of these computers are, are very high reliability, have very high reliability expectations to them because they control critical functions of the car to keep the passenger safe. So to your point, um, that all is driving the cleaning process as well because these aren't throwaway boards anymore. And then we throw in IOT where, you know, and wearables where, where people are putting electronics on their body and then walking into harsh environments. I think it's cold 
where you are. It's raining where I am at this very moment. That's a harsh environment. Uh, and we're taking this stuff into harsh environments. So yeah, the, the cleaning is probably has probably never been more important. And with low standoff components and with jet printing uh, and, and multiple thermal cycles, uh, it's also more challenging than it ever has been before. Absolutely. So let's switch topics and get into material selection. Let's assume someone says, okay, fine, I need to clean. I, I give in. Um, they, they, they buy a, a, a machine and then they buy a chemical. Uh, there are several th- things, several considerations to make sure that the right um, solutions are put together. And, and some of the material selection criteria involves uh, kind of a checklist item of, of things. In a, it, and we assume the first checklist item is it has to work. It has to perform. It has to give you the cleanliness expectations. It has to meet the cleanliness expectations that, that one has. But outside of that, um, one of the, the – in the old days of cleaning, I started in the cleaning business in 1985. And uh, back then, there were one or two brands of – chemical, very few machines to put them in. And the pHs were like super, super high. So if the board had any metal surfaces on it, if it had aluminum or, or other types of, you know, nice, bright, shiny uh, surfaces on it, uh, the board would go in bright and shiny and come out very dull, including the solder joints, um, because there was no such thing as corrosion inhibition back then. It was just all high pH to go after a, you know, acidic flux. So Let's talk about uh, protecting surface finishes for a moment. Uh, What are the best practices involved to, A, obtain the cleanliness we expect and and not damage any of the surfaces and anything that might be on the board uh, as well as flux? Sure, I can address that. So my standpoint is R&D, so I always think about everything from a development standpoint. And, And this is Dr. Terry Price we're speaking to, right? Yeah. Got it. And so when it comes to protecting the surface, the finish, it always comes down to the trade-off you want. So we can address the development from putting in the correct inhibition packages, increasing them to the level that's needed. We can keep the product alkaline, or we can dial it back a little bit. We can put in a little bit less of the inhibition package. We can start to lead down the avenue of a pH neutral product. Maybe it's a little bit gentler. And then, you know, we also have to look at what type of flux we're playing. Do we need to put something into the formula that's more aggressive? How is that going to play off? So it's all a balancing game. And so when we look at the balancing game, we're just addressing it by how do we get the most performance? How do we then maintain the inhibition package, the uh, uh, protection that we need in the formula? Yeah, Mike, and, uh, um, this is Sal Sparacino, um sales manager, so I'll, I'll just kind of add a little bit more to what, what Terry just said. Um, as, as I think you already commented, you know, as far, or, or at the begin, at when, when cleaning companies, you know, first came out with the aqueous based cleaning agents, pretty much everything is alkaline based, um, which is fine. I mean, alkaline cleaning agents are, are, are you know, they, they certainly perform well, and in general, I'd say the pH values are somewhere between maybe 8 to 14. You know, or thereabouts, and as you know, you heard from Ravi previously. Um, you know, things have changed, and some of the things that you said, you know, as components have changed and whatnot. Um, there's more, uh, you know, sensitive plating, um, and coatings, and so on. And so, a lot of the alkaline cleaning agents are now inhibited, as Terry was just saying. And and we certainly have inhibited alkaline cleaning agents. However, what we found in, in our case, and, and this started for us around 2010, um, we saw a market need for pH neutral. And what drove it back then for us was issues around material compatibility. And again, we did have alkaline-based cleaning agents that had inhibition packages in there. Um, however, you know, in 2010, 2011, in, in addition to people being more sensitive to material compatibility, um, there's people that, or there's companies uh, uh, that want to be better environmental stewards. Let's say, uh, you, you know, there, there's a, you know, we're dealing with a chemical here, right? So if we can develop something that's pH neutral, more environmentally friendly, um, and it still has material compatibility um, uh, features of the alkaline cleaning agents, we saw that that was, you know, filling another market need. 
And, and, and these cleaning agents on these pH neutral side, we also found that we were able to drive down concentrations. You, you know, you mentioned a little bit of this earlier, you know, we're in that 10% range or so, sometimes even less. Um, and sometimes even, you know, at some of the lower operating temperatures, you know, generally speaking, 140, 145, and 150, but certainly within that, within that range. Um, so what's interesting to us is over the past, let's say, eight or nine years, um, our pH neutral product, uh, well, the initial ones were designed specifically for the SMT uh, boards, right? Uh, you know, just pretty much for the surface mount um, and, and, and on the deflection side. Of course, we've been doing um, pH neutral formulations for stencil cleaning for years uh, because that's a requirement in that area. But for deflexing, it's certainly a different story. Uh, but however, so in, within the last seven or eight years, our pH, one of our primary pH neutral formulations has basically, you know, surpassed in sales our alkaline cleaning agent. But having said that, our alkaline cleaning agent has actually um, tripled within the last six years. So what we've seen is that our alkaline cleaning agents, and these are inhibited cleaning agents, and, and it's sometimes depending on the, the flux formulations, you know, you need more solvency. You need, you need, you know, you need a cleaning agent that is alkaline to remove those flux residues. Um, but however, it gets back to our engineering team and with these guys doing the things that Robbie had talked about, um, you know, making sure that we understand what what kind of flux residues are, are, are the customers dealing with, what their material compatibility issues are, um, are they concerned about environmental type issues? You know, is pH you know is pH neutrality something that is, you know, of primary importance for that? So we we've just seen that pH neutral. Um, market need has risen substantially over the last five, six years, um, as well as the need for more advanced alkaline cleaning agents. And then kind of along the lines what you were talking about with the bottom terminating components and so forth, like our initial patients with cleaning agents, again, were designed for the service mount, um, uh, you know, basically, you know, service mount components and so on. But in recent years, we've done a lot in the semicon area. So our, you know, the newer pH neutral cleaning agents we have are designed to, you know, do defluxing for, you know, discrete devices and lead frames, power modules, and so on. And 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 funny enough, the same the, the same um, cleaning agent that we have for the power electronics in, in 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 the neutral formulation, we actually have alkaline versions of the same one. You know, for the reasons I've already started talking about that. You know, there, there's some. You know, there's just you know, there, there's a there's a particular called flux mix paste mix out there that you do need the higher level of solvency. Um, you know, it's it, it's just what it takes to you know you know to do a proper defluxing. And again, those cleaning agents have inhibition packages, so we still have the great material compatibility, and um, you know we're able to you know pretty much meet the expectations of the customer. So we had a president many years ago that was coined to coin the phrase, you know, speak softly and carry a big stick. Um, I, I view the the cleaning chemicals as the stick, and I'm I'm guessing pH neutral is a small stick and elevated pH is a bigger stick. And one uses the size stick that's necessary to remove the soils. Um, and, and a smaller stick might be necessary if there's a lot of metal to be protected, a lot of other surface finishes to be protected. And uh, a bigger stick may be necessary, i.e. higher pH um, inhibited, so it doesn't cause any more damage than, than, than it could have. Uh, those bigger stick chemicals might be required for uh, jet printing or for uh, wave solder applications where they spray on or, or foam on, uh, uh, you know, gallons of flux onto, onto the assembly um, and, and then bake it five times um, and burn it on. That's where I'm, I'm assuming the higher, the elevated pHs come in handy. Is that a correct uh, metaphor? To, to a certain extent, but it... It all kind of comes back to like dissolving like, and so whenever you make these these solvents, these cleaners, these mixtures that we're using to clean the boards with, you you think about a host of parameters. Uh, typically, uh, they're referred to as the Hansen parameters. So even even if a product is neutral, the solvency, the parameters of of that specific cleaner might match a flux better than an alkaline cleaner. 
So in some instances, it's just due to the nature of, of the similarity between the two of them, allowing it to clean better. So there's some instances where if you have flux A, solder paste A, it's always going to clean better with the pH neutral product just because it's more similar. Um, but to the analogy of the bigger stick, there's some truth in that. Once you have a alkaline product, you can begin to envision a situation where if you have certain types of polymers, certain types of residue, the alkalinity can actually go in and help break that apart a little bit. So you're, you're basically removing the chemical residue in addition to the solvency based on uh, also now including in maybe breaking up what you're trying to clean a little bit, the burnt residues. Excellent. Now there's other material compatibility issues beyond metal finishes, and that's uh, labels, uh, uh, compatibility with the equipment, uh, with the environment, uh, with uh, safety uh, for personnel. Uh, how does what are the what are the benchmarks that people look for? So let, let's start with labels. Um, we have sometimes customers will call us and they have ten labels on their board when they put them in, and, and and they have zero labels on the board when they take them out. So of course we blame the label manufacturer because <laughs> um, they're supposed to they're supposed to withstand that. But are there are there um, uh, chemical solutions to that? Are some chemicals more uh, uh, damaging to labels and and the adhesion uh, of the labels than others? And are there ways short of changing label suppliers? Are there ways of ensuring that labels stay on uh, the way they're supposed to? Uh, Mike, regarding that, uh, again, uh, last year we did an extensive testing with all the label manufacturers. Uh, when you start looking at uh, the leading label manufacturers such as the Brady, Identco, Flexcon, and such, uh, they sent us uh, like a range of like uh, hundreds of different labels, and we did the testing in uh, both the inline and batch cleaners with uh, six to seven different cleaning chemistries. And we have seen that, again, it comes down to there are some labels which are much more compatible with a certain type of chemistry, and there are some which aren't. And uh, from the label standpoint, there has also been, like, as we are changing the cleaning chemicals, there has been improvement in uh, cleaning agents, and there is also uh, improvement from the equipment standpoint. Uh, the label suppliers have also done improvements because the, the older technology labels, they used to make use of the polyamide po labels and the top code which was been applied on those labels were found to be incompatible with the latest generation cleaning chemistries. And uh, again, uh, to a great extent, the uh, labels uh, suppliers are uh, basically uh, getting affected because of the change in technology with the board design, the lead-free solder paste formulation, the low profile components, the increased process settings that's required. Because uh, if you look at say like 10 years back, the process settings were typically like you were running for five to seven minutes of wash time and a temperature of around 120 degrees Fahrenheit, which was enough to clean the high profile components and uh, uh, larger standoff heights. So the labels were not getting aggressively exposed to that uh, aggressive settings. However, now that the board design is changing and the components have changed, and we are starting to see jet printing and more lead-free soda paste and flux formulations, uh, customers, they have to clean those flux residues. So they have to use those aggressive settings. And in trying to use these aggressive settings, the labels are getting compromised. So again, it comes down to like, uh, it's not only like a relationship that's between the chemical companies and the equipment guys, but the labels are also, uh, they need to be involved. And now they have to also make sure that the labels are fully compatible from the, like not only the adhesive that uh, uh, needs to be like uh, properly cured, so that uh, the adhesive doesn't get softened up as a result of which the label can peel off. And at the other uh, end, uh, the inks needs, the used on those labels needs to be chemical and solvent resistant so that the inks doesn't get washed off. And also the top coats, the top coat layer, which is on these labels also should not be affected, uh, especially if these uh, boards are going through uh, longer wash cycle times and increased temperatures. Right. And then we also have to be sure that whatever chemical is put into whatever machine, that 
you don't have what I like to call the China syndrome, where, where there's a hole in the bottom of the machine, um, where the chemical is just eaten through. And I think what, what most equipment manufacturers are concerned with are their seals. The, the, the metal surfaces obviously are, are impervious to the chemicals that are put in there. But the, the seals that are used in the pumps or the solenoids or the doors or whatever uh, are elastomer or polymer type materials. And, and they can be subject to um, damage based on what chemicals are exposed to. So how does any chemical company go about when they come up with the latest and greatest um, chemical formulation that will be the best cleaner ever developed, how do they make sure that uh, it can actually be used and, and not just its effectiveness, but its preservation of, of seal materials and other materials that are part of the cleaning process? So basically what we do is we just go down the list and we test all of the different plastics, rubbers, et cetera, and we, we address it like that. And I'm sure you're probably in contact with equipment manufacturers, or I think in your case, you guys have a lot of equipment in your, in your lab. And I'm assuming that you already know the list of materials that are being used in equipment and, and you test for compatibility that way. Sure. Uh, hi, Mike. Um, this is Amos, actually. Um, in addition to what uh, Terry mentioned, yes, we keep a track of um, a knowledge database uh, where we call it the Technical Data Sheet 3, all the polymers and machine parts that are commonly used in our industry. And we work very closely with you guys and other equipment manufacturers. We ask you guys to send us the seals and materials of construction to us. And we expose these materials to our cleaning agents for an extended, for short term as well as a long term period of time uh, at highest concentration that's you know recommended at a higher uh, temperature. And we look for like material gain, weight gain, uh, brittleness, surface change or color change. Uh, and uh, we you know, rate these materials as like plus, meaning like it's compatible. Uh, zero means it needs to be tested because as there are different grades of that specific polymer material and negative means like just avoid using it. Hmm. Let's talk about safety for a second. You know, coming, being in the cleaning business for as long as I've been since the mid eighties, you know, we used to wash our hands in flammable toxic solvents. Uh, you know, we really didn't pay a lot of attention to safety back then. So safety has come a long way with the water-based chemicals, the aqueous-based chemicals that, that you guys and other companies make. Um, but there's still, at the end of the day, is a safety concern, even though it's a thousand times safer uh, than it was uh, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, what are the criteria for safety when, when a chemical is being developed to be used uh, for defluxing, for example, or for the semiconductor market or whatever? What are the uh, primary safety concerns that, that a chemical manufacturer would, would look for and that a buyer of that chemical would look for? I mean, by far, the most important thing, since these are spray and air at high pressure, is the flashpoint. I mean, you, you definitely don't want your facility blown up because you're trying to clean something. So whenever these are being developed, that, that by far is the first one. If uh, something's going to yield a flashpoint that might result in a dangerous situation, then it's just avoid it for the aqueous space cleaners. The next side of the coin is handling. So... Um, I guess we can all get on board here and say definitely we're not using anything that's going to cause you cancer, kill your unborn baby, etc. So the next thing that we really want to look for is how safe it is to handle. Is it going to burn you right away if you have a little bit splashed on you? Is it going to be a situation where you have time to wipe it off, potentially minimizing the damage? And so as you go down the list, the first check mark is going to be making certain you don't blow anything up. Second check mark is going to be making certain that there's no uh, acute dangers, no long-term dangers if somebody's handling it. And so as it goes, we definitely pick raw materials. We definitely pick items to put in a formula that are safe because we don't want anyone to be hurt. And it's just not usable if it's too dangerous. Does that kind of get what you're looking for? We used to have in the old days, um, I kind of keep aging myself because I keep talking about the old days, but <laughs> in the old days, I used to call it a shoe test. And, and we would 
pour a chemical in a machine. We were constantly changing chemicals based on what the customer's requirement was when they were coming in for a demo. And we'd inevitably spill chemical on our shoes. And in the early days of, of cleaning, that would ruin your shoes. I can't tell you how many pairs of shoes I had to buy um, because I spilled chemical on them. And uh, in modern days, you know, we still manage to spill chemical on our shoes, but, uh, but I can say that uh, most of the chemicals that are being used today are, are shoe proof. We haven't ruined any shoes lately. So that clearly there are advances being made um, with the uh, safety aspect of chemicals because I, I can testify to that because I haven't had to throw away shoes as a result of contact with, with chemical. Uh, and then I know environmental uh, concerns are always there. I know the chemicals that are used today are far more. In fact, they're a result of environmental uh, crackdown. The chemicals that were used uh, in the old days for cleaning were uh, CFC-based chemicals that would chew up the ozone like Pac-Man. And, and the new chemicals kind of came from that that. Montreal Protocol, the ban on those chlorinated fluorocarbons. So right out of the gate, environmentally, all the new aqueous-based chemicals in particular are extremely safe. But we have, uh, we still have concerns about safety uh, or chem- environmental safety, and and with the litigious nature of uh, disgruntled employees or or local municipalities wanting to get permits for everything that goes on in their, in their townships. Um, there still are environmental concerns. And, and I know in Europe, they're kind of leading the charge with all, the, all these environmental uh, efforts. Uh, and one can spend an entire podcast talking about whether they're, they're valuable efforts or not. However, it still puts in people's mind that they're concerned about environmental issues. And for people who are coming to cleaning for the first time now that don't have the comparison to how it used to be, they probably have the same environmental concerns or questions that, that were present back in the eighties when there was a real need for that. So uh, how does your industry satisfy the, the, the various uh, national environmental standards and perceived uh environmental concerns uh, with your customers? Yeah, so that comes back to two direction. Uh, recently, uh, looking at the pH neutral material, um, a lot of customers have came to us asking for neutral products. So that addresses one. And now we have pH neutral products on the market and they've been widely adopted. The newest topic and the newest concern for us is VOCs. And so now we're looking into the development of low VOC products and how we can address the air quality. So the first major concern environmentally that came up was basically water quality. Uh, We addressed that through the pH neutral products and now we're leading down the road of addressing the topic of air quality through a lower VOC type product. Excellent. Let's change gears here and talk about something that's quite topical at the moment. Uh, IPC just released the new uh, J standard 001 G amendment one, which opens the doors to allowing the use of virtually any type of cleanliness quantification technique, as long as the user can provide objective evidence to show that that particular method is, uh, is accurate, that, that the reliability prediction is accurate. Uh, before this Amendment G, or, or G Amendment 1, uh, was released, uh, pretty much the entire industry relied on ROSE testers, resistivity of solvent extract tests. And you know it's important to note that ROSE testers are still part of the equation. They can still be used, but so can other devices now and methods. Uh, the only thing that, that really was the, the major outcome of the uh, uh, version G Amendment 1 was the pass-fail limits. So no longer can one say 1.56, that's my pass-fail. If it's 1.57, I, I reclean it. If it's 1.56, I ship it. Because those numbers were established back in the 70s before we even knew what surface mount was. And and they're, they've been, for decades, they've been obsolete. Something we've been preaching. Um, so the the testing methods, whether one was doing SIR or ion chromatography or ROSE, are still valid tests. It's just 
there's no one industry standard pass fail number that's being recommended. Instead, it is a case by case basis uh, relative to that specific board. So let's talk about various ways. There are some uh, old standard methods uh, which have been used for a long time, and then and then there are some kind of newer. Um, innovative methods that may be useful for certain people. Let's talk about uh, some of those methods. Some of the old standard methods are surface insulation resistance testing, or SIR. We have ROSE uh, testing, uh, which has for 50 years been the most popular, uh, and that's available in bulk testing or localized testing. So one, a ROSE tester can test the entire board or a section of a board. There's ion chromatography, which is my favorite, um, And versions of that, there's climactic chamber, steam age testing, visual testing. It's amazing what we see when we look. Uh, And then there's uh, uh, kind of coding reliability tests. So is and then there's non-standard tests, which are reactive tests like a flux test, resin test, where uh, the board will change color on at the presence of of flux uh, and other types of tests from your experience and your customers um, input. What types of testing um, do, do, does a chemical company uh, use under which types of circumstances? So we can go through the list of SAR, rows, ion chromatography, uh, et cetera. Uh, we can go to kind of the non-standard test, me- test methods, which will now be allowed if, if someone can provide objective evidence. Um, what's your go-to method or is there a go-to method or is it just a, a host of different testing methods for certain uh, situations. Hi, Mike. This is Amut again. Um, I will uh, personally actually divide it into two categories, the indirect way of measurement and direct way of measurement. Uh, When I say indirect way of measurement, of course, one first of all has to make sure that uh, all his cleaning parameters are where they're supposed to be at. That means that you got to be at the right concentration of the cleaning agent. you got to be you know, uh, having a good pH alkaline or pH neutral level, conductivity, as well as the non-volatile residue amount in your wash bath. And of course, that will not ensure that you're going to be getting like you know clean boards at the end of your wash process. So that's the indirect way of measurement, uh, measuring the clean or assessing the cleanliness level of the boards. Now, the direct way of, of course, can be divided into two categories. The standardized ones, which are recognized by the IPC um, standards, and as well as there, there are the non-standardized ones. Now, the ones that we have, you know, counted like the visual inspection, uh, the ROS test, the ion chromatography, SIR, electrochemical migration, falls under the um, standardized direct way of measurement. And uh, with that, we can start with the visual inspection. Uh, we still refer to the IPC A610. Uh, you know, uh, most of our clients use an a magnification of between 10 to 40x, uh, looking at the bores after they come out of the wash, um, followed by the ROS test or the ion chromatography. But, you know, I see in a lot of clients, first of all, going straight to SIR testing or the accelerated um, climatic reliability failure test. And if the bores fail that test, then they go back to identify the root cause of the failure by conducting the ion chromatography test. Now, as you mentioned, uh, the ROS test will be obsolete, but m- many people have been using that for years. Uh, the pass or fail limit 1.56 was a standard at some point, but again, most of the people are trying to find out the correlation between the SIR testing and the IC so that they can use the IC testing as a process control method. And just to be clear, uh, because and I'm glad you said this because it gives me an opportunity to respond. Uh, and. I said this yesterday when we were, I was doing a podcast with Doug Pauls um, explaining the new standard. Um, you know, we do have a horse in that race just, you know, for transparency purposes, we manufacture rose testers, but not to be reactive to that. But uh, just to be clear, there is a, a thought because that was the number one go-to tester for so many decades. Uh, and when the new standard was released in October, it, it was li- widely described as, yeah, rose is now obsolete. You can't use it anymore. What, became obsolete was the pass fail limit, not the, not the test itself. Um, Rose is still um, usable, uh, just not, you cannot rely on, on a 10 micrograms of sodium equivalent per square inch or 1.56 per centimeter squared pass fail limit. It's the pass fail limits that were ripped out from under the test, not the test itself. Um, so- I that, Mike, like uh, the J standard 
it tells like uh, the new amendment it does say is the rose test uh, needs to be used going forward as a process verification tool and yes. uh, not as a process qualification tool like for process right. qualification it needs to be done in co- combination ion chromatography and sir and you can still do the rose test and uh, if uh, a particular board meets the sir and ion chromatography and it gives a certain value in the rose testing you can always use that particular value as a guideline for process verification on your map right right yeah th- no thanks for clarifying that that's what i meant it it's still usable to uh, confirm the process is stable and when it shows that something has changed one can then go to um, ion chromatography which is most frequently an outsourced test which is why people aren't using it uh, as a line tester Um, it it would be too expensive to do that so the rose tester will be used to flag a warning to get uh, extra data from another recognized process but even the results of the ion chromatography have to be objective evidence backed um, there's no longer a well as long as you get this number you're fine uh, that the this number pass fail uh, is is really no longer part of the standard anymore uh, and and it, and for ion chromatography it never was um, uh, it, it was a useful tool but but there weren't really published standards on uh, on populated assemblies uh, there was on bare boards uh, but on populated assemblies it's far more complex to come up with a predictive number that will guarantee reliability when IPC doesn't know where the board's going. It doesn't know what its cost of failure is, and it doesn't know the density of the components and its tolerance for residue. So you're absolutely right. Uh, the rose test is the first line of defense uh, to flag a, a change in process. Uh, and then uh, ion chromatography or other, or SIR or other analytical tests um, backed by objective evidence, I, I believe is the way the standard is, is published. Is, is that a universal understanding or is that my unique understanding? Oh, you're, you're right about that, uh, Mike. Like uh, uh, the amendment actually says, like, uh, if I'm not mistaken, they classify it under a few cases where if a customer has been relying for 10 years on a rose test and is build, building up boards and he has enough objective data to validate that rose test and he has not had any failures in the last several years then he can continue to rely on rose test yeah because he has the objective evidence to prove that but for new products for a new process they cannot just going forward rely on rose test as just as a qualification tool there needs to be something more objective because exactly. as mentioned earlier the rose test was it developed almost 30 40 years back when it was all rma based flux formulation but right. we are going towards no clean and the ipa water is not that strong enough to solubilize the no clean fluxes and that's why there is a need for more uh, objective or more sensitive testing such as uh, the ion chromatography and SIR. Yes. Yep. We're on the same page there. Um, I didn't mean to derail the conversation. There are other extremely valuable tests. I like steam age testing because that's the closest thing to a crystal ball we have in this, in this industry, um, a board under a bias, under heat and humidity. Uh, I talked to a, a guest a couple of podcasts ago, uh, you know, about a 2000 hour test, um, Obviously, that was process qualification, not something every board was subjected to. But but that certainly is is an indication, a view into the future of of how a board will function uh, over time. Um, I do love visual. Visual is a requirement. There is, you know, you certainly, you know, it's amazing what you see when you look. Uh, the only caveat with visual is not everything you see is harmful and not everything you don't see isn't there. Uh, you know, so it visual is usually contextual. It has to be mixed in with other facts. Um, but certainly always look, always inspect per, per the, per the IPC standard. Tell me what the, um, let's talk about some non-standard test methods. Uh, tell me about, uh, the flux test and resin test, and contact angle measurement, and, and, and some of the other tests that are, uh, clever tests that have not been widely adopted, uh, but could be very useful for specific applications. Uh, the non-standard test methods which we uh, 
over here at Zestron, we frequently use is uh, the flux test and the resin test. Uh, the flux test is actually a test solution that we can uh, use it to identify the presence of, uh, say, like the invisible carbo carboxylic activators, which is typically the part of flux formulation. So the idea behind using this type of non-standard test methods is, again, it's uh, uh, all this test, the flux test, resin test is more in terms of uh, qualitative analysis. It's not a quantitative analysis. So by applying this test solution and waiting for a few minutes and then rinsing the boards and looking under the microscope, the flux test has a tendency to react with uh, any remaining flux, part, uh, carboxylic flux activators, and it will show like a blue, uh, blue colored stain or blue residues on, around the solder joints. And uh, depending on the amount of the blue residues or the stains and uh, the location of this uh, residues, we are able to uh, identify if these residues are critical or not critical or depending on the location and the amount, we can just see if it's going to be like a short-term failure or a long-term failure. But again, this flux test is uh, something it only reacts with uh, like the carboxylic activators. Now, most of the flux formulations they typically have is like the flux, uh, they have the carboxylic based or uh, they have the halide based activators. So the flux test was designed to react only with the carboxylic based activators. Now we also have the, similar to the flux test, we have the halide test and the halide test is supposed to be reacting only with the halide based flux activators. So, and then we also have the resin test. So the resin test is something which is, uh, again, a test solution, which you apply onto the boards or certain critical areas on the board. And uh, it would react with those resin, rosin residues, and it will turn amber or yellowish in color. So that would again tell us if there is any resin or rosin, which is also a part of the no clean flux formulations. So all these test methods are a quick test, like within a minute to three minutes, you are able to identify the presence of uh, this flux components. And uh, if you see any of those uh, stains, then you know that there is definitely some residues left behind on the boards and uh, which needs to be completely removed, especially before the boards are going to a subsequent process such as conformal coating or say in case of semiconductors like a wire bond or uh, some kind of shear test and pull wire pull test. So the, this test are free, pretty frequently used over here at Zestron. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, these are more of a qualitative and not a quantitative one. Right. They're what I, what I like to call a red flag test. They, they yes, don't absolutely. necessarily say you have a problem, but they say you might have a problem and you might need to do further um, testing uh, to determine if the flux that's visible through this reactive test is harmful. Um, but it does. It, it is a first line of defense, I, I suppose. Um, there are other tools as well. We're kind of running out of time, so I c we're going to have to wrap this up uh, soon. But there are other tools uh, also. Are there any particular uh, go-to um, testing methods that that your engineers will use, your chemists will use to um, quickly show there may be a problem on a board, or or to give a you know a feeling of of uh, relief that uh, it passed this test, so there's probably nothing uh, left on this board. Yeah, so we can uh, talk about a report that we just generated this week. So Robbie had did some of the resin test, flux test. He uh, saw some blue spots. He came back to us and he really wanted to know what was there. And so what we did, we did we used FTIR. So we uh, took a microscope, we mapped it out completely, and then we we went through and we made a uh, very large grid. And we went through and we looked at his part completely. And then based off of the signals you see and the intensities you see in the FTR spectra, you can map that to every single point that you would take on a part. And then you can develop an idea of the entire part where you see most of the flux, how much might be left, how clean your part actually is. And it, you can make very beautiful maps on of this where it all correlates really well with the uh, with the visual test you see from the flux. 
from excellent the test. excellent so we we discussed as a panel we discussed um the challenges to cleaning, we discussed material selections and compatibilities, we discussed ways to quantify cleanliness, uh, both standard and non-standard. Are there any other uh, comments that any of our panel uh, wishes to make to to kind of put some frosting on the cake here? Um, the only, well, this is Sal again. Yeah, I think the only thing I would say is um, it, it, it's a forever evolving industry. Um, you know, and, and, and I think as, as, as we have done collectively over these workshops over the years, um, look at a printed circuit board circa 1980 and look at what's on your iPhone today or whatever, and, and you see what the challenges are, right? And as, as the industry changes and as 5G is on the horizon and who knows what these components, like what, what these structures are really going to look like um, on our side and, and even your side, Mike, right? We have to continue to evolve our technologies to meet the challenges you know that are coming down the road almost almost every day now and, and pretty much as as we found out here on the jet printing study um you know that was something completely unexpected and you know we realized that customers were having issues and it took a little bit of r d and and a lot of testing to identify you know what those true issues were and, and how to overcome those challenges so right. you know I, I think we're fortunate as a company to have the the R&D staff that we have that enables us to, you know, continue to evolve our, our formulations. Um, and and we're, we're, I'd say we're, we're certainly pleased to be able to work with folks like yourself as well um, on the equipment side because, you know, as we said earlier, everything goes hand in hand. You've got mechanical, thermal, and chemical energy, and it's the combination and optimization of those three that meet the, you know, really meet the challenges in the field. So there we go. Yeah, well, one of the things I thanks Sal. One of the things I said in my in my intro, um, which you haven't heard yet, uh, was that the cleaning is a, a end of line process, or virtually one of the last things that occur in the assembly uh, process for electronics. And as a result, where the the cleaning process falls victim to every process decision that was made before it, um, like the invention of bottom terminated components, or uh, or uh, jet printing, the things that we've discussed before. Um, so we are a very reactive industry. And not only is our industry reactive, we have to react proactively, which is kind of an oxymoron. So we have to not only to react to what we've seen, but we have to guess at what, what we're going to see, look at the trajectory of, of technology and challenges and uh, sell a product that works 10 years from now. And and not just mechanically, but but have a, a, a relevancy many years from now, uh, which means there has to be R&D. We constantly have to be looking in our rearview mirror to see what we've learned from decisions that were made in our industry in the past and then project them forward. So uh, R&D is a big part of the cleaning industry. And if anyone wants to decides they need to adopt a cleaning process, particularly if they haven't had one ever or in some time, uh, then working with any company, whether it be chemical or equipment, um, to ensure that they have something that works today and something that will work five or ten years from now is, is really important. Uh, and fortunately in our industry, in the cleaning industry in general, there are a number of companies. There's a number of chemical companies, a number of equipment companies that, that are good stewards of technology and, and, and plan for the future. Uh, so that that's the good news. Um, as much as the as we talk about cleaning challenges, uh, Fortunately, maybe maybe if this ever comes, I'll, I'll retire eventually. But but um, we haven't seen anything as an industry that we haven't been able to solve. It's been difficult. It's been challenging. We've had to get quite innovative. But our industry has has always risen to the occasion. And even though we talk about challenges, um, we talk about them from uh, you know problem solution standpoint, not just problem. So uh, we are overcoming as an industry the challenges that technology brings to us. Uh, and, um, and, you know, I, I just say that so that if someone thinks they need to clean something, we don't scare them away thinking, oh, no, this is nothing but challenges. Um, you know, we concentrate on the challenges because that's what's interesting. And we don't talk about things that are easy uh, because that's, that's boring. So um, our industry does and your company does uh, in particular a very good job at, at overcoming those challenges and, and working toward future challenges in advance of their arrival date. So I want to thank everyone for being part of this of this panel. Um, I, we plan on 
tackling several matters. Yesterday, uh, or a couple days ago, we were talking about voiding. Uh, today, uh, we're concentrated on cleaning, which is close to my heart. Um, and we'll do this again. We'll put a panel together on various subjects, cleaning and other reliability related subjects. And I, I'm really pleased that you guys uh, all joined me today in, in this uh, first cleaning roundtable. Well, thank you, for, thank you for offering to us, Mike. Thank you. My pleasure. Well, that's another episode. Thanks for listening to Reliability Matters. If you like what you hear, please be sure to give us a like. Just click the like or heart button below. If there are any reliability-based questions you'd like to have answered or specific topics discussed, let me know. I can be reached at mike at mikeconrad.com. That's Conrad with a K. Don't miss another episode. Subscribe to Reliability Matters on iTunes or follow us on Spotify. You can also listen to us on iTunes, Spotify, AqueousTech.com, PCBChat.com, Spreaker.com, or our newest affiliate, Ascendo Reliability on Reliability.fm, a site dedicated to all things reliability. Once again, thanks for listening. We'll be back soon with another episode of Reliability Matters. In the meantime, keep doing it right.